You can find and subscribe to the premium episodes of this podcast at pitch.supportingcast.fm. On this week's premium episode, you can hear the pitch and first three pages of the feature script, Empty Chairs, by Zach Catone and Gabriel Dominguez. Make sure to check that out. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Pitch. I'm Leah St. Marie. And I am Angel. And today's episode is a little bit different and has kind of a backstory. Angel, do you want to walk us through that? Yeah, so I've got a, a, a neighborhood. I live in a neighborhood. And one of my neighbors has been walking her, her dog by my place for several years now. And then she got another dog and we became friendly. And we learned that we're both writers, both in the entertainment industry. And so we started to talk about things. And I told her about the podcast. She goes, that's really cool. Um, one of my friends is a, is a really big fancy writer. You may have heard of her and some of her stuff. And I was like, oh, who's your friend? And she said, Liz Hanna. And Leah goes, oh, my God, I love Liz Hanna. One of my favorite movies is one of her movies. So she said, I would love to interview her. Or we, I, maybe we, we approached you all and said, would you be willing to come on the show if we had a little friend interview set up? So that's what we're doing today. It's true. It and is true. We're here. That's the voice of Carrie, and that's the voice yeah, of Liz that's, Hanna. That's me. I'm Carrie. I'm the neighbor with two dogs now. But not a mistake. Dogs. Two very big dogs. <laughs> Made a mistake. <laughs> not, just, not just a neighbor. I'm a friend. You're a friend, and you're a writer, and you I'm do a writer. A bunch of stuff. Yes, I'm a writer, and I'm an actor and a producer, whatever. But I'm mostly a dog mom <laughs> because the second one has really just ruined my life for I mean, the better. God bless you for taking in that pup. She's really beautiful and so dumb. <laughs> She's really, really, really dumb. <laughs> but a big old heart, big Huge big heart, heart. It's a tiny that, little brain. It's I, just that number one was perfect. I mean, like, Millie is the perfect animal. She is smart, and she is kind, and she's a human zipped in a dog body. And Frankie has no thoughts. They're bubbles. <laughs> she's young still, bubbles. though. She's young still. She's a baby. But you got her trained up really well, which is working on it. super important. Anyway, that's how I make my friends now is because I'm only outside walking dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I got to give it to you. You, like, walk those dogs so much every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, like, I mean, I have a small well, apartment. They yeah, go, like, well four exercised. miles a day. Yeah. I That's don't off. walk four miles a day, so... Listen, you have a human. I have a human and a dog. And, and well, a... your dog is also a human. That's true. She's quite human. And she also, if I tried to walk her four miles a day, would quit. Yeah, she'd She run. would just be like, <laughs> no, she wouldn't run. She would quite slowly walk back home <laughs> and be like, I'm done with this. Can we curse on this podcast? Is that a thing? Yeah, this is, okay. a, yeah. this is a Ch not safe check. for work. Not podcast. child friendly. <laughs> no. I, mean, I have a child who... Only, only the ages between five and eight listen to this podcast. Great, 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 great. great. Yeah. I was just need to know what my audience Glad we're here. was. Yeah. <laughs> my wheelhouse. Yeah. Um, Leah, you were going to say something? Oh, uh, I was just going to say you should introduce yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that's me. That's my introduction. That's just who I am, where I am now is dog mom. <laughs> but I could use work. So if you're listening to this, I also work in the entertainment industry. Yeah. And you were an actor on... I was on Plainville. You were on The Girl from Plainville. I was yes, on you were. an episode of The Girl from Plainville with one of my besties. It was... What a treat. It was me and you flew to Savannah. It was... Savannah, I hung out a lot with Liz's husband. <laughs> yep, yep. And dog. And dog. And dog. You, we, I don't, what month were you there? October? That was. September? I don't, November. I mean, it doesn't particularly matter because it was hot the whole time. Yeah, so. it was November, I think. Oh, I was directing. So yeah, it was November. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's yeah, right. I also episode. directed that episode. Mm -hmm. It's all coming back to me. Yeah. You know, it's been, it's been, it's been whirl a couple wind. years. <laughs> it's been a whirlwind. Yeah. Um, do we need to do a real intro, intro for Liz or? I mean, for those of us, for those of our listeners who don't know who Liz Let's Hanna do is, that. why don't we talk about a little bit, whether you want to do that, Carrie or Liz, like. I definitely don't want to. You do. So Liz doesn't <laughs> want to. So Carrie, why don't you share with um, our listeners some of Liz's magnificent accomplishments? Well, I mean, I don't know if any of your listeners know these smaller filmmakers like Steven Spielberg and Meryl Streep, but that's kind of. Liz's like jump off point for this crazy whirlwind life that she has now is she wrote the post. Don't know if you've heard of it. I'm getting so many ads right now for it, by the way. <laughs> Are you really? Like on Oh yeah, it's on freebie. freebie. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I'm getting served hard. They're like, we see your phone book. I also <laughs> got targeted for the post ads recently. They, and know, I, your, they know your history. <laughs> I found it remarkable. It's ridiculous. I was like on Instagram and scrolled up and <laughs> got to and, and the post on freebie so if you haven't seen the posts and you would like to watch it you can watch it on freebie apparently Here's i i don't know what that is but it's a place that you can watch the post it's things that you can stream things yeah 
That's what it is. Like the post. That's their tag yeah. line now. Um, and then we went into what was right after the, the post. Um, I had Long Shot. Long was Shot. was my next movie. And then I did All the Bright Places on Netflix. And then I did um, In Between Long Shot and Bright Places, I did Mindhunter Season 2. And then I did most recently The Dropout and The Girl from Plainville. And Girl from Plainville was showrunner too. I show ran, showrun. Yeah, I co show ran and directed and wrote and So we just keep first. we just keep kind of fucking nailing it, if you're asking me. <laughs> but um that was my sneaky way to make you do them in order because I know them, but uh-huh. thank you for that. You're welcome. Uh so you know, she's done I guess some writing. I would say she's green. Mm. Um <laughs> I'm just dipping my toe in the water. <laughs> I don't know if it's for you. Yeah. Emmy nominations, Oscar nominations, wins, Oscar, Emmy wins. I mean. Yeah, that's a fantastic, we'll see. fantastic track record so far. Uh, it's There's only really one way for it to go. So I. That's down? Um, Is that down? It's completely down. <laughs> so there's <laughs> truly. At the top. There's truly. I, really, I, I have to say, starting, there was nothing funnier than like my first movie. I'd never sold a movie before. I'd never had a movie produced before. Produced before. I sold the post, which was a spec, and it was Amy Pascal producing it. She bought it, and then Steven Spielberg signed on to direct it with Tom Hanks and Meryl Streep, along with like the most insane cast of all time, and Janusz Kaminski and John Williams, and it was really dumb. And I remember being on set and looking around, and one of the cast members just turned to me and went, good luck next, and walked away. And I was like, <laughs> fair point, fair point. <laughs> And um, I've had I've been very very lucky in in the next part, but it's um, that that narration is constantly in my head of uh, good luck next. So well, I mean that is a perfect place to start because my favorite story of you and me specifically. Mm-hmm. Oh <laughs> yeah, comes... it was actually like kind of the moment you and I became like really good friends. Yeah, because we met we met like probably what year did you sign that? Uh, that was 2016. So 2016. So we met probably four years before that. Yeah. Um, and we would see each other and this is, we'll get into that, but we would see each other around and like hang out with our friend Kara, but like mm-hmm. never us mm-hmm. alone. Yeah. Um, but our friend Kara, who is the best, she's best. born in October, always had these amazing Halloween parties. She's born the 29th. So she, her birthday was always Halloween weekend. So for... 15 years, every Halloween weekend was a massive, like, Kara birthday party. And it just so happened that the the party was on Saturday night. The Friday before this in 2016 was the day that I sold the posts. And then I got the offer to sell it. And I went to... I couldn't tell anyone, both out of fear of it not coming true, fear of jinxing it, and then genuinely, like, there was nothing to say because it wasn't real yet. And my husband was, um, who was, I think we were engaged at the time. <laughs> he was in New York. In, my husband's also a writer producer and he was in New York on production. So I went to this party by myself. And we'll preface this by saying that I was younger than I am now. And I was quite nervous. And so, and it was a party. So I just started doing jello shots really early. <laughs> and, and look, it was a Halloween party. It was so a like, Halloween party. To top it off, it is like everyone's getting fucked up. Yeah. I mean, there's beer pong. Like, That's we're where I found about, you. Like, yes. We're talking about like we're in our late 20s, early 30s at yeah. this point. Everyone is irresponsible, but responsibly drinking. And we... So... I need and to it's pa- also I need to pa- it's also important to note that it's a costume party. <laughs> That's what I was just going to do. <laughs> and... Kara and her husband Ben and I had done a theme costume to Stranger Things. So I was dressed as Dustin and had blacked out my two front teeth. <laughs> and I just want to note that usually I would have been at this party hours before I actually got there this year, but I had a play that night. And so I got there around like 10, 30, 11. And, you know, we were young, but we weren't like so young that we hadn't started drinking yet. It was like, you know, we were pretty I've been like drinking seven. since like six. Yeah. So what, by the time I got to Liz at this party. I was not sober. No. She was not sober. She was fully Dustin. And she was like, look at my teeth. <laughs> I showed up as What About Bob. Yeah, it was Bob great. from What About Bob. Oh, so that's like, good. That's good. You know, we, had, yeah. we have a beautiful picture from we that We do. Night. We do have a lovely picture from um, that night. 
but I was like, oh, I think I need to go. You know, I, I have this play again tomorrow. I'm a little bit tired. So I was leaving earlier than I normally would have. Yeah. And I'm going to let you pick that back up. Yeah. So it was like 11 o'clock and I had just gotten a multiple phone calls and text messages from my manager and my lawyer telling me that the deal had closed, that my deal had closed on the post. And I tried to call my husband. And so I ran outside to try and call my husband and he was asleep because he was shooting on the East Coast. And I just called him and left a voicemail that he still has to this day, which is not flattering, but uh, is me basically hysterically crying and screaming at the top of my lungs that he needs to call me back. And I was standing outside of Kara's house doing this and looked over and Carrie was standing there and I just burst into tears. And (laughs) Carrie was like, could not tell what was going on because I also hadn't told anybody what was going on. And so I told her and I was like, you're the first person who knows this because my husband didn't answer his phone. (laughs) And that's where we are. And that's where we are. I mean, but the best part is like half the party was already outside, but Liz went into the front yard and is screaming. She's screaming and like hysterically sobbing alone in the front. And I like leave the front door and I was like, you okay? Yeah. I I physically carried her, made her walk with me into the bathroom. And I'm like moving people out of the way to get to the bathroom in the house. And I was like, we need a little space in here. (laughs) Well, and then after, and then you did have to go and then you left and I proceeded to celebrate my evening by their, their dog comment again, their dog had like split his nail. And so I, because I was both drunk and empowered by the strength of selling this (laughs) script, like laid on top of the dog and held it down so that we could like fix the dog's toe and make it stop bleeding. And there is a picture of me also from that night, just like nearly passed out on top of sweet, sweet Yogi while he's having his nail treated. And again, no one knowing what's going on. And so I'm just crying. I'm crying while Yogi's crying and we're all getting our nails treated. <laughs> that's what beautiful. A uh, great start yeah. to your career. Wow. It's interesting. That's how I spent last night also. So, you know, yeah. I like laying that it's, on Yogi. Yeah, be- on Yogi's because it's a holiday, it's like documented with photos. Yes. It's <laughs> and, and like the best costumes. And you know, at the time, you're always like, oh, this is just like a shitty costume. I threw it together. You guys, we look great in that photo. We look great. But the thing that is it, like, <laughs> is that when you black out your two front teeth <laughs> like that, you don't, um, it's not like I had like dentures in or anything. So mm-hmm. I forgot for the majority of the night that I had blacked my two front teeth out. So uh, when I got to the point where my husband finally like woke up and saw he'd missed a hundred f- phone calls and I talked to him and I could finally tell people, <laughs> I was like weeping and telling people the most amazing professional news that had ever happened while not having two front teeth. Mm-hmm. This is so classic. it was good. It was, no, it was great. I was the first and I'll tell you a plus no notes. <laughs> <laughs> try and accomplish that from now on. Thank you. Same Only way. good news with no teeth. You know, I'll try. You know, it's just all I ask. It's fine. I, that's, I think that's a fair ask. Fair. Yeah. Okay. So the first question is how did we meet? Do you remember this? No. Wow. Wow. Yeah. No, I think it was at Kara's I mean, we, house. We definitely met through Kara. I think it was the first time we met was at like Kara's house, Ooh, probably I, Seder. I was going to say it was like probably a Passover yeah. type of thing. Yeah. Um, but the first time I do have an answer to the first time that I knew I wanted to be your friend. And we went to that. Do you remember when we went to the roller derby? Oh, yeah. I. This is the first time we did really, really hang out, though. And then you proceeded to not tell me this story for like seven years. Many, <laughs> many years. But it, it really tickles me because it's like a very very accurate description of all of the players in the story. So I'm sitting with Kara, one of our best friends, and Liz and our friend Emily are sitting right in front of us. And you and Emily grew up together. Yeah, we've known each other since we were four. And so Emily and uh, Liz are sitting right next to each other, and Kara and I are right behind them. And I'm, like, talking to Kara, and I'm a little bit shy. Everyone already, like, were really close, and they knew each other. And so, like, every now and then, you know, sometimes I'm like, I think I'm funny. (laughs) So I, like, had something funny to say to Liz and Emily, and I would, like go up behind them to one of their ears and I would be like, hey, did you see that girl slant? I could do that. And like no fucking reaction. I kept doing all night. I would say something. I would like make any comment about anything. And I would like look at Kara. First of all, if you've ever been to a roller derby, it's really loud. It's so loud. It's echoey. 
it's a lot, you know, it's like a skating rink, but they're like no fucking joke. Well, it's a, but it's a skating rink inside like a high school gymnasium. And there like are people cheering. And yeah. they're fighting too, right? And they're yes. fighting. And they're so fighting and there's yelling yeah. and there's tons of music. Like it's very loud. It's really loud. So just say that you're, you had set a very high bar for our ability to hear you in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just, just saying that's that. That's fine. that's fine. That's fine. I accept. But I'm like, I keep leaning forward and I would do it to like, but I would like try and go in between them or I would go to just Emily or just Liz. And then I turned to Kara and I was like, they don't like me. They don't even notice that I'm here. And she's like, what are you talking about? And I was like, I keep trying to talk to them, but they like won't even respond. And Kara's like, they're both deaf in one ear. <laughs> and I was like, wait, actually? Yes. And so they always, oh, like when I had met God. Emily and Liz, they would always sit on their good ear side to each other. So like they can just chit chat. And yeah. so like I would always, you know, I'm like trying to be polite, not stick my head in between. And I'd be like, hey, Liz, check out that girl. I bet you could wear that. And she's just like, nothing. Yeah. Total deafness. Total- yeah. Speaking into a void. I, no, I mean, I'm, I'm 70, 80% deaf in my left ear. Emily is like 100% deaf in her right ear. So in a, in a, in basically a gymnasium that was having a rock concert <laughs> with a WWE wrestling match. The, the idea that we would be able to hear her is just it's ludicrous. Absurd. It's ludicrous. It's ludicrous, but I also like... But you also didn't tell me... You literally didn't tell me the story for like seven years. I didn't tell you until... Yeah. Yeah, for a very long time. Well, because I was like not only self-conscious that it happened, <laughs> but self-conscious that I was like self-conscious about it. Like, it's not <laughs> me. But of course, we walk around this world and I'm like, there's something wrong. They don't like me. And yeah. Kara's like, bitch, they can't hear you. Yeah. <laughs> This is a great lesson for all our listeners. Maybe someone doesn't not like you. They could just be deaf in an ear. It's just. true. It's true. And Liz is like one of my legitimate best friends now, but I like was ready to bail that night. I was like, I, I was like, so they were, you guys were having so much fun right in front of me. And I was like, they, they hate me. No, they we didn't. Hear me. We just couldn't hear you. It's well, the, the end of the deaf ear stories is that there was nothing funnier to me than Kara one time we went, Kara, Emily, and I flew up to Seattle together, and she bought plane tickets, and we mailed her, sent her the money, mailed her the money. What, mm. what did I do? Like, mm-hmm. no, I Venmoed her. No, and, we're um, And she called me, and she was like, I've been sitting in front of this fucking computer for like 10 minutes. Who's deaf on what side? I'm sitting in the middle. Just how can you hear each other? Just pick the seats. And I was like, this is great. I'm so sorry. Also, like we could just switch seats. But I love that you're like, I'm going to book the tickets correctly. I will do this right. Yeah. Oh, But it was so freeing to know. And like as your human friend, it's yeah. like very validating to be like, oh, she's not mad at me. No, I just can't hear you. She's busy on the yeah. other side. Yeah. Um, so that's not really how we met, but that's like, that's when I chose friends. Yeah. Yeah. That's when I chose to keep fighting. (laughs) (laughs) I chose nothing because I didn't know I was part of it, but I, I, and Emily too. She's just along for the ride. And I was like, sorry, you're here now. I claimed you. I had picked you. So I was excited. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's kind of how we met. Um, and I think you've always been a writer. You went to school in in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Which school was it? I went to Pratt. Pratt. And then you came out here to do AFI. Mm-hmm. But I went to AFI for producing. Okay. So mm-hmm. tell me like Pratt to AFI journey. Very quick. I graduated from Pratt in June and I was at going to AFI in September. But you mean really? like. Really? Yeah. I didn't realize it was that fast. Yeah. I was going to AFI when I was 21. Damn. It was, a, it was I made poor choices when I was younger. I mean, not, I think. I'm very happy I went to AFI. It's an incredible community. Um, and I'm really proud of being an alumni. But going to grad school when you're 21 years old and like moving across the country from where I'd lit, I grew up in New York. I'd gone to school there. I moved to Los Angeles. I didn't have any friends. Like I was 21, which everyone who's not 21 knows that that's, you're basically 14 still. Like that's <laughs> Your not, brain's a, not done. that's not, you're not done growing. And I was, thrust into an incredibly professional competitive environment with people who were decades older than me. Um, so I, it's, it's an experience that I think is like incredibly unique and I'm, I'm excited to have achieved and, and it's something I'm really proud of, but it's definitely something that I look back on. I'm like, I probably could have gotten a lot more out of that had I been slightly older and had like a more conscious idea of 
who I was and what I wanted to say. Cause I was just like a cocky, dumb little child and, you know, walking around acting like I knew what I was doing and knew what I could do. And I knew nothing. Yeah, I barely no one, know anything now. So you know. I don't know anything now. But also, like, no one knows what they're doing. I just think you're not aware of it when you're that young. Like, yeah, that's, I that's think the I think, like I just didn't have the self awareness or like confidence to be, I think, clear about what I did and didn't know. And that only comes with like sustained failure and <laughs> realization <laughs> that like being a cocky asshole does not get you anywhere. Uh, it does um, sometimes. It does, but it doesn't get you everywhere. True. Uh, and and that it's a really good way for people to hate you. Um, <laughs> and so I, but like I, I, I went to AFI when I was 21. I, gra- I was there for two years. Um, and then I graduated. I went for producing. When I was there, I was interning at, at a production company in the meantime. And I was... You know, I think I was very, um, I'd always written. I was very interested in writing uh, professionally, but um, I mean, that's not really true. I would have like, I that was my, if I would have confessed a dream to anybody, it probably would have been that. But I was so insecure about, I mean, again, C, 21 years old, but also like I was just insecure about my own writing. I was insecure about being a writer. I was insecure that like other people were better than me at it. And, um, I didn't think I also was like, I just spent a kajillion dollars on a master's degree in producing. So I think like then pivoting to writing when I had already like had a financial investment in one path felt like a very scary thing to do. It's terrifying. Um, and so I went into producing and that was what I did. So you were producing for how long until you pivoted again? I was, I mean, I was working development for like four years, five years almost um, at the same production company that I'd interned for called Denver and Delilah Films. I worked there um, in the summer in between my first and second year of AFI. And then um, they offered me a job midway through my second year. And so I went on to eventually I was working in development there. And it was a really small company. There were like four of us at the time. Um, it's still a pretty, it's a very intimate like kind of group of people. Um, and I really enjoyed working there. And it was a female-led company and um, very interested in telling stories about strong women that are complex, which I think is often um, not what people are and people I think often think of like strong women and they become very two dimensional because we are like, how dare we show a strong woman that's also flawed, Mm. but that's turns out, you know, humanity and we exist and yeah, we're here. And so 50% of the audience. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Like 54, just just yeah, it was true. A majority of the audience. Um, (laughs) And I, so I, I really liked that and I felt really inspired by that about finding sort of true stories or, um, or scripted stories about um, women. And then I, but about halfway through working there, I was like, I really want to try and write. And it wasn't, I mean, part of it is that once you read enough scripts, you you lose the intimidation factor. You know, you just, it, the more you read, the less of it, of it feels so out of touch or out mysterious. of grasp. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like, Oh, it's, there's, there's actually like quite a structure. There, there's, there's a <laughs> magic to it. There's structure and there's, a science in a way. So I, and I, I find writing well and writing dialogue well to be rhythmic and to be like music. And I felt like I had a little bit of that in me. Um, and so I started writing full, I started writing, I sent my boss a script and, um, she told me I should quit and write full time, which may have also been because I had written a screenplay while having a full-time job. And uh, definitely one of those things suffered (laughs) while I was writing the screenplay. (laughs) She's like, I'm not going to fire you, but also please don't come back. (laughs) And, um, that was when I was 27. I left like, like on my 27th birthday, I think. And then I'm, I met my husband like two, three months later, four months later, two months later, two months later. Um, and then I didn't have a job that I, I didn't, I didn't sell anything for like three years. I mean, I had various jobs. I worked in like a phone bank. I was like an assistant to random people. Um, and then I got a job on a digital television series where I was the writer's assistant. 
and it was really tough. It was like not, it was just not for me. Um, I find writer's rooms very, very difficult. I'm not somebody who was raised in writer's rooms. I'm not somebody who like, um, necessarily has that like instinct. And, and so it, for me really has to be like the right group of people and the right leader and the right sort of scenario. And, um, I was going to go and ask for my job back. And Brian, my husband was like, um, you should write the Catherine Graham movie that you've been talking about for at this point, you know, the entire time we'd been together, I, I'd thought about writing it like six or seven years earlier. And then finally, um, sat, so I sat down to write it. So that was the summer of 2016. You're pretty unbelievable. Did you know that? I mean, you're my friend. Yeah. You're on the I... side that can hear. So you have to, see you're welcome. Things. Yeah. yeah. No, you're right. I say, Although, I talk a can lot we talk of shit. About how today when I went to sit on the couch, you asked what side I wanted to sit on. See, I do have to ask. I'm like Kara. Like I, it's hard to it's hard to file the left and right. You know, I'm still okay, like Brian looking still at walks my... on the wrong side. And I'm like wrong side, bro. wrong side, bro. Yeah, he'll Poor start talking Adam. to me. I'm like, can't hear you, man. Nope. Yep. Not today. Actually, Thanks. stay there. I'm yeah. having a nice time. <laughs> <laughs> no, Brian's great. He's actually one of the greatest human beings on this planet. He is. He is. Um, so I have two things I want to ask you that you just brought up. First of all, I know you, and I know the way that you exist as a writer and a human that you just surround yourself with excellent people and like if you're just not good and I don't mean like the best not necessarily like the um, perfect writer Mm -hmm. I mean like if you're just like not a good person you are not getting a spot in your life Um, but that translates in a way to the rooms that you're building these days even though most of them have been mini rooms Mm -hmm. you surround yourself intentionally with the right people for the job. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something not only admirable, but it's harder to do than it sounds. It's hard. It's easier said than done Mm -hmm. in that. Like people are like, well, I just want to like hire my friends. And it's not that you're not hiring your friends. It's that you want the proper perspectives Mm -hmm. for that room. Can you tell me about like what goes through your mind when you're setting up like a mini room or if you have a big room space? I think putting a room together for me, a successful room requires uh, like at a fundamental level, a, a very, very honest amount of self-awareness of your own self as a writer, of your own self as a storyteller. It, it can also be as a producer, as a physical producer, but you need to be aware of your strengths um, just as much as you're aware of your own weaknesses. And, and I think, so that's one sort of big circle and then the other big circle to sort of push together that's a venn diagram that i'm trying to look (laughs) think about that is um is what the story is that you're telling you know sort of deep down like what what actually are you talking about i think for plainville there's you can sort of because this was something that was very it was it was a lot of consideration for this room i'd never run a show before so i was very conscious of the type of tone I wanted to set um in the room it was very important to me that that everyone in that room feel not only that they had a safe space that they were coming to but that they were they were providing a safe space for everybody the show itself is about um it's about many things but in one of the largest things it's about is mental health and the way that we discuss it and the way that we project it we project our own mental health or or um, feel that it is being projected and protected. And so knowing the, I'm, I'm a very, in a room, I'm a very open book person. I overshare. It's just sort of my, uh, that's my coping mechanism for breaking something is, is just sort of like talking about experiences I have, thoughts I have, things like that, and hoping that it unlocks something for someone who's smarter than I am. And I think, with Plainville, it was, I, I never had any concern of feeling uncomfortable sharing, but I wanted to provide a space that if anybody else wanted to share, I also say like, I never have an expectation of anyone sharing anything in a room. Like it's everybody's process of talking about themselves or their own lives is their own. So it's less that I'm like, I'm an oversharer, meet me at this place. It's more like I wanted people who I knew could accept that, could provide a space for other people if they wanted to share or provide or or share themselves, feel vulnerable. Um, 
So that was like a really unique thing for a room. I don't I don't think typically you're looking for that amount of kind of vulnerability and and back and forth on a, on a writing job. Um, but it was just such a unique scenario of a show. Um, so that was one thing that was really personal to me just in terms of like what I needed to be able to trust the people that were in that room with that show. And then the other was like really looking at what myself and, and my co-show runner Patrick was only in the room for the first few weeks cause he was, he was in production on another show at the time. So then it was really having kind of like very hard conversations with myself about what I lacked and what I needed and I think that one of my strengths is character. One of my strengths is not plot. And so it was finding a group of people or one or two people that filled out the room who were incredibly good at plot and incredibly good at sort of structural, typical television storytelling. And I don't mean typical in a derogatory way. I mean like the kind that we all feel is almost like a warm blanket of storytelling and we can watch something hard because we know the structure inherently and how it continues. So there was that. I then like also we knew that we were going to have musical numbers in a television show that is mostly about mental health and suicidal ideation, which was an interesting thing that it's a choice. It was a choice. And, and we knew that that choice was unconventional. And so we wanted people in the room who would think unconventionally. Mm -hmm. I mean, it worked. I think so. It was, you know, it's definitely, you didn't see it coming. Um, and so that, so this is all sort of like a long winded way of saying like I, my process of putting a writer's room together is truly being incredibly narcissistic and saying like how, what is, what am I good at and bad at? I don't think a narcissist thinks like that. That's fair. But uh, it's, it's quite self uh, a, a, yeah, it's self uh, referential and like and and self reflective, yeah. and I think um, uh, and I think it should be because eventually you know the writers' room goes away and you as a showrunner are left with hopefully all scripts written going into production and making all of the changes that are necessary for production by yourself unless you're fortunate enough to have writers that you writers or a writer that you've continued on to the show which just frankly studios and networks don't do that often anymore. So I fortunately on Plainville had another writer plus um, Patrick was back. Um, He had wrapped and he came, I think he like finished post like a week or two into prep of Plainville. And so um, we, the three of us had it, but um, you know, the room does go away at a certain point. So you have to have a group of people that can support your vision for the show while bringing their own expertise to it and un, and and providing you basically the lift to go into production to have a um like a a blueprint of where the show can go because so many things change in production and so many things change in prep that if you don't have that set up then then you ever it's a house of cards yeah you set yourself up for failure yeah Um, amazing. I I think it's really interesting that like something that I don't think we talk about a lot in this industry is the self awareness of it all Mm -hmm. that it's like, oh yeah, you know, we made this show and part of the show, but it's like a good show comes from the fact that you are sitting there like reminding everybody that they're as important as you are in Mm -hmm. that room because Mm -hmm. They, you need their perspective. They're good at mm-hmm. plot. Mm-hmm. You're good at character. And once you put those together, it's like, oh, that's what makes a good show. I think it's also like a, about communication. Like I just, I, um, I, I, every show gets, gets rewritten in, in post or excuse me, in, in production uh, to either a minimal degree or to a maximum degree. Mm-hmm. Like at the very minimum in terms of like, you lose a location. So you have to change something. So any, anything is adjusted at various points. And I, and I think people inexperienced in rooms, um, and some, inexper- and some ex- experience in rooms are, are, don't expect that and, and really cherish the word on the page. And, and some showrunners are like that. Some showrunners cherish every word on the page. I'm just not precious about the page. Mm-hmm. I'm precious about the, you know, 
600 pages that have been written that matter towards telling the entirety of a television show. Right. Rather than like the word the in episode two that feels like an important placement for the, you know, musicality of a sentence. Sure. So I, I think there's also a lot of of give and take and communication that's necessary between the showrunner and the staff to understand that and to appreciate that and to, and to not get all tangled up when things change. Yeah. Yeah. I, by the way, am the worst person to be rewritten because I fucking hate it. So I fully am them and like (laughs) I get it and I just request, I always, unless I'm involved, I just tell showrunners not to tell me what they changed. And I was like, I just don't want to know. I was just, I'll be like, it's fine. It's fine. It's just, yeah. I don't need to know. I don't, I don't want to know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Same thing in features when I'm rewritten. Just don't tell me. So that, I mean, that brings me to my other point. So the writer in you, listen, I am a writer also, and I fucking hate it. There's so many things about it that I hate, but I love it at the same time. Mm-hmm. It's a very abusive relationship in my mm-hmm. brain. Tell me about the things that you love about writing and is there anything that you're like me that you ac- absolutely hate? Because if there's not, I'm going to have to say that we can't be friends anymore. <laughs> I mean, I hate the majority of writing. Yeah, it sucks, dude. I think that's a lot of our audience. <laughs> yeah. Like, why is that, though? Like, it's What the is worst. that phenomenon where it's so painful or whatever the reasons that you hate it? Because I, you're trying to, to take something that doesn't exist but exists in your head and 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 intellectually and emotionally physically churn it out onto a piece of paper so that someone else can mm-hmm. read it and see the exact same thing that you saw in your head, but that will n- almost never happen. And that's, I think, the thing is that, like, once you realize that writing is completely subjective, <laughs> 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 just your depression level skyrockets really quick. <laughs> But I no, I think it's like it's really hard because it's it is completely subjective and and so like it's 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 also so fucking lonely and miserable mm-hmm. and like personal and it's only worse when you realize that it will be better if you get more personal mm-hmm. and that sucks. Just like therapy, it truly I'm working on my wounds, <laughs> untangled. I'm untangling my wounds, and I think that. So I, I mean, that's why I hate it. <laughs> so I can't speak for everyone. But I, it's also like I, I really, really, really hate a blank page. And I know it's so cliche. But like I hate a first draft more than almost anything in my job. It's on one hand because I'm just an exceptional procrastinator who also has an anxiety about procrastinating. So it's a really vicious cycle. But also like. I just want to get to the point where I can rewrite it because it's going to what you love. Like, what do I love? I love rewriting. I love I'm myself. I'm, I don't re- like rewriting other people, but I love rewriting my own work. I love finishing a draft and knowing like this is such utter garbage, but there is at least like a pathway now to making it better. I always think the magic happens in the edit. Totally. Always. Yeah. And like nothing can get better if it doesn't exist. Exist. Um, but it making it exist is so hard. It's painful. It's quite painful. And like the figuring out like what it is in this amorphous sense before you put it on paper is just so difficult. Um, so I really like when it's done. That's my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite part of writing is being done writing. Yeah. I think I don't, it's not, I don't think it's Nora Ephron, but it's, it might be. It's that there's a quote from someone who's the, my favorite part of writing is having written. Yeah, which is but it, my it's place. true. I mean, it's like you, you give birth to this thing that lived inside of you. Yeah. And if, you know, you've been in this place many times now in your career where you're like, oh, you get it. And that yeah. thing gets made and the world gets to watch it and they get it. And you're like, whoa. Yeah. That was in my brain once. Yeah. It didn't exist until I made it exist. Of course, that, that's like the magical part. Yeah. But the actual writing of it man it is brutal sometimes and those rewards are so delayed from like when you finish a draft to when an audience claps Mm -hmm. or like leaves the theater happy is like years if not decades in some instances so what is your reward then when you're in the like midst of it drinking jello shots (laughs) jello shots um uh, there's little ones along the way like 
just like sometimes, I mean, I mean, all writers, I think everyone here will understand this. Like that moment you, it clicks Mm -hmm. like that feels like a reward. Mm -hmm. Like the moment that you're sort of like, this isn't just me banging my head up against a wall anymore. It's, it's actually like, there's something here, um, feeling in a scene that something is working and that something like a little magical is happening. That feels like a reward. I, um, like buy myself something after I finish a little treat. Yeah. I buy myself a little like thing. Um, it doesn't have to be much. Like I can go buy myself a cupcake, but like I try and like get something for myself to feel like this was an accomplishment. Um, I mean the reward for me is having been finished. (laughs) Yeah. Not having to look at it anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's my greatest reward. <laughs> um, it's it's kind of a nice feeling to just like have like fully be done with the thing. Mm-hmm. Although it's gonna forever live in your soul. Like it's, yeah, I don't it's... watch things after they're done. So I don't. I watch them once and then I move on. I can't rewatch them. I hate. I hate. Death. I directing was different. It was the first time I had to like constantly and obviously as a showrunner I was in the edit and in post and so I had to be like very physically a part of that um so I've watched Plain Mill more times than I've watched anything else I've ever done um and I'm okay never watching it again I love it I think everyone's so incredible on it but like it's just I've spent thousands of hours of life of my life watching it um I just don't but like outside of something that I'm either showrunning or directing I don't watch anything yeah I haven't, I, I watch it once and I move on. Yeah. I just don't, it's like, it's not, it'll never be exactly what it was supposed to be. It can't be. And sometimes that, it can be better. Like, I think Longshot is better than the script. I think Longshot, and that's not because, like, of, of Seth improvising. Um, and it's not, it's just, like, I think their chemistry is so, like, electric and fun and not something you can write and something that feels, like, completely off the page. And so every now and then I'll, like, catch a scene of that on TV and I'm like, oh, that feels really exciting because it doesn't feel, um, like, self gratifying Like, I, I don't feel like I'm... It's not self-gratifying to mm-hmm. watch it because I don't actually connect that much to what the finished product is in a... In a in, in not in a bad way, but in a way that I just think it surpassed the script in so many ways. Yeah. Um, but other, I, everything else I've made, I, I've watched one at once and then I don't One and it. done. One and done, baby. She's a one and done, baby. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about new stuff. Um, tell me, like, what is your pitch process? You have an idea mm-hmm. and you are going out with it. Mm-hmm. Tell me, like, step by step what happens. I mean, you don't have to go like baby steps, but no. Yeah. I mean, I just went like, it just made me so sad. Oh no, 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 not, not in a bad way. Not like, not like sad, sad, but just like, it's such a, it's such a slog. It's such a long process. Um, I mean, I, this is probably like the worst possible thing to say on this podcast, but I like viscerally hate pitching. I hate it. I hate it so much. I hate it. I've gotten better at it frankly because zoom exists now and i just don't pitch in person anymore so i now have a script that i can read and that feels also to anybody listening i have that my my body hates los angeles so my allergies i'm sorry if i sound congested um you really don't you said that to me earlier i just i like feel like my head's swimming i'm not sick i promise it's just allergies but i um but i i i've gotten better at it because it's such a necessity for my job, <laughs> but I just truly hate it. Um, it for me, it kind of depends on what stage of the process I become involved in, or what type of material exists for what project. For Plainville, um, the article by Jesse Barron for Esquire existed and was optioned by the studio. Patrick had an overall deal with the studio. Um, He says this himself, so I feel very comfortable saying it for him. Spoiler alert, he is not a woman, nor one that has, nor is he anyone um, who's experienced what it's like to be a 17 year old girl. So he felt um, inadequate in some ways to do it by himself, which I think is incredibly self aware, and and frankly, a lot of writers would not have that awareness. Um, He, so he, Really wanted to bring a partner onto the show. Elle had read it and Brittany, Elle Fanning, who's on the series, had read it 
and was interested in meeting. And Brittany Conward, my manager and producing partner, called me and was like, you know, you should come do this with Elle and me and Patrick. And I was like, hardest of passes. I had just done a TV show and I was really, really burned out and I was really tired and those mean the same thing. And I, um, I was like, I'm going to go back to movies for a little bit. There, there, there was a movie that I'd been talking to somebody about making for a long time. And I was like, I think if I put my focus on this, I can crack it. And, um, and I, I, so then she didn't listen to me (laughs) and then I, (laughs) Ah, oh, Brittany. Uh, and then we love I, her for that. We do love her for that. And then I finally read the article and I realized that the article sort of, while, um, and, and comp- I, it's an incredible article, but in, you know, doesn't have the page count or the space that a television show has to fully explore, like began to scratch the surface of questions that I never asked about the case uh, uh, of Michelle Carter and Conrad Roy III. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. And Michelle Carter really scared me as a person, um, both like on a human level and then as a writer to sort of imagine writing her, which made me lean in. And then I met Patrick and I we just clicked immediately. And so that was January 2020. And then and what we, happened? And then we decided <laughs> that we were going to write the pilot and then pitch it. So we would write the pilot together and then pitch the rest of the series. And at this time, he already had this overall. He already had the overall deal, which is why he was on, he was the person that UCP had gone to, amongst other things. He's very talented. And so we started writing the pilot, and then obviously the pandemic happened. Uh, I think the pandemic happened like truly like a week after we turned the pilot in. It was like we I turned. I think you're right. I we, vividly remember yeah, that. Yeah, we like turned the pilot in. We felt really, really good about it. Um, I've had a lot of writing partners in my life. I like, I've had many arranged marriages and, um, (laughs) this was the first time where it happened this early that we like just clicked very quickly and writing quick clicked very quickly. And the pilot just like came out very easily. And then the studio was extremely excited to take it out. And then obviously the pandemic happened and, um, everybody sort of waited, I think, to figure out what was going to happen as we all remember Mm -hmm. um and then eventually we decided that we would take the show we took the show out once everything is sort of i want to say quote unquote settled down but that it didn't you know and so we pitched it over zoom with ostensibly everybody had read the pilot but you know i think probably half of the people in a room have read the pilot when you send the pilot so our pitch process involves the I'm sure you've read the pilot, but just to recap in case you haven't, <laughs> um, which I always tell people to do just because they haven't read the pilot. And if they have, they don't remember. Mm-hmm. And then we have, I want to say it was like a, probably it was like a 15 minute pitch. And then Elle came on and said like a couple of things about why she wanted to do the show. And that was it. And um, so that my, my process is generally like a, um, what suits the series the best when it comes to television. I haven't pitched a movie in a really long time. I'm, I mean, I cannot articulate enough how bad at pitching I am, particularly at features. And like part of it is because it just takes me a really long time to figure out what the movie is. And I will get committed to something happening in the movie in a pitch and then back myself into a corner because when I'm in the middle of writing it, I'm like, ooh, that's not what it should be. Mm-hmm. This um, is this is great because um, I emailed a bunch of Oscar-nominated and Oscar-winning screenwriters from the 60s onwards. And one of them who was nominated in the 80s got back to me and he said, uh, thanks for writing. I look forward to listening to your podcast and perhaps getting pitch pointers. I'm an absolute disaster at pitching. I have to write the whole script to get anywhere. Yeah. So it's like par for the course. Yeah, it, it it absolutely is, and I think like I I recent I'm producing and directing a movie that we just pitched, and I'm not writing it, and the writer sent me the the pitch document to like give notes on, and I was like this is, like I cried reading it. And if you want to find out why Liz cried when she read the pitch for the feature she's producing and directing but not writing. 
then you have to check out next week's episode where we finish our chat with Carrie and Liz. Thanks for listening. For both Leah, myself, Carrie Weisberg, and Liz Hanna, I'm Angel. Cheers from Hollywood. If you're on the fence about subscribing, know that a portion of all subscription fees go toward the nonprofit Young Storytellers, raising voices one story at a time. <laughs>